Welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast, where we focus on having positive and productive conversations around money. I'm your host, Lauren, a four-time Olympian and certified financial planner. On this show, my guests share their money stories. Everyone has a unique story and experiences both wins and losses when it comes to money. My intent is to give listeners something they can relate to, something that builds their courage to be open and take control of their own money story. When I'm not creating a great show for my listeners, I'm running my company, Worth Winning, where I help individuals and families organize their finances. Check us out at worth-winning.com. All right, now on with the show. Welcome to Financial Literacy Month in the midst of the COVID crisis. Yikes. There's been a lot happening lately and a lot of it has not been good. So I hope everybody's doing well. I know you got a little bit of cabin fever. Stay safe though, stay indoors, take care of one another and have a lot of online parties. I know I got to say, it's been really hard to see so many stories about how people are being negatively impacted financially because of the state of the world. And while it's sad, I have seen also a bunch of people mobilized to fill the gaps as the needs have arisen. So shout out to those who are trying to help however they can. But there are also some who are operating from a scarcity mindset. I'd encourage those who have saved up and are doing okay not to shame those who are struggling and to go a step further and extend your resources to them. Yes, it is true that some don't have because they're wasteful, but that's not the majority of people. Many literally do not have enough to meet their basic needs on a regular basis, and some that do don't have the literacy to use their resources more appropriately. And even decent earners and savers have been punched in the face by all that's happened over the last few weeks. Why people are struggling doesn't matter at this moment. No one saw something like COVID coming. And while I prepared for an emergency, I certainly wasn't thinking, hmm, let me save some money in case the world goes on lockdown and the economy tanks and tens of thousands of people die because of a new virus. Like, you know, there's no way that we can prepare for something like this. But if everyone picks one person to help out during this time, we will all be okay. It is true that there is a limit on the amount of help you can provide, but I assure you, helping one person will not bankrupt you. And while we're on the subject of help, let's talk about what our government has designed to aid us in various ways through the CARES Act. So it's important that you guys do some research about the resources that are applicable to you. But here's my quick list of things that I found that seem to apply to a broad audience. The first is if you make less than 75K as a single person and less than 150K, you're eligible for a full $1,200 stipend as per, I think you get it via your tax return. So you had to have done your taxes. Additionally, those that have a giving heart are being rewarded for doing so. So everyone can write off $300 of charitable contributions. So usually you need to itemize your deductions. It needs to be over whatever your standard deduction is in order to take advantage of charitable contributions. But everyone will be able to take advantage of this $300 deduction. So that's even more incentive to give to a good cause that you care about right now. The other thing that I want to tell you is about how student loans are affected by the CARES Act. This is awesome if you have federal loans because you get six months of no payments and no interest. And you should have already seen that hit your account. So they're rolling it out, like I said, as quickly as possible. All of this is happening very fast. So if your servicer hasn't done it yet, be patient. Uh, If you need to make your April payment and then try to get it refunded later. But technically this started on March the 13th and it goes all the way through September the 30th. So you should have $0 payments and 0% interest for that time period. So what do you do with these freed up funds? Well, if your income has been cut, then you're probably going to be using it to cover basic expenses. That's kind of the purpose of this. But if you're one of the lucky people whose income is stable and You can redirect those funds to paying down other debt that you may have, building your emergency fund during this time, increasing your retirement contributions. So make sure you consider what's the best use of those funds and give that money a job. Don't just let it disappear. One other thing I wanted to tell you guys about is that it counts for forgiveness. So if you're on a 25-year plan or a 20-year plan using income-driven repayment, 
it's counting towards your forgiveness. And if you're one of the people that's on an income driven plan, that's also going for public service loan forgiveness. This six months of zero dollar payments is still going to keep you on track for those two forgivenesses. Take that into account. The last thing I want to share is a little about the Paycheck Protection Program and the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan for Small Businesses. So the thing about these loans is that they can become grants if they're used appropriately. That effectively makes them free money, but you have to use them appropriately. And even if you do decide to use the loan, it comes at a much, much lower interest rate. So if you're funding things on your credit card right now as a small business owner, because of all that's happened, these loans could be a really good option to make sure you're not racking up credit card debt, ruining your credit, and paying super duper high interest rates. So as of the release of this episode, the Treasury is still sorting out the details, but you definitely want to look into this if you're self-employed or a small business. So if you need help, speak up and take action. Now is not the time to suffer silently. There are resources that are being offered and they're offered so that they can be used. Nobody is judging what you could have, would have, should have done up to this point. If you've been caught off guard, don't beat yourself up. Decide to take steps to recover. I did some brainstorming on what I could do to help and decided one easy thing for me to do would be to offer my course for free for the month of April. So it's generally $600 and technically it's three courses. So I need to go ahead and pump myself up a little bit. Part one is money mindset. Part two is spending with purpose. And then part three is optimizing your finances. So once you got that good foundation in place, you got your mind right, you go ahead and get your budget right. Then you go ahead and optimize things. It's amazing. So if you need that in your life, I'll go ahead and add that link to the show notes and don't hesitate to go ahead and use that during this month. For me, this is about encouraging you to spend your time in isolation doing something to change the trajectory of your life. So no more pity parties. Let's take action. All right, I'm stepping off my soapbox now so we can get into the actual topic for this season. Budgets. So when it comes to a strong financial foundation, the budget is at the base of it. But budgets get a bad rap. So I thought, what better topic to cover for Financial Literacy Month than the big bad B word. Now, I got to keep it real with you guys. It was really hard to fill this month because so many people do not have budgets. Others are self-conscious that the way they budget is not the right way when there's no one way to do it. The not at all way is the only thing that holds you back from achieving your goals. So whether it's a notebook, if you're tracking every dollar, you're using an app, The main thing is that you're creating a spending plan that gives you awareness about where your money's going so that you can decide if that aligns with your values and then you can feel more freedom. So what we're doing this month is five guests, each with a different perspective on budgets. And I figured it was important to lead by example. So I am starting the series. All right. So let me explain my high level view of setting a budget up quick. I subscribe to something called the 50-30-20 method, but it's not the one that you find on the internet. But it's a really good way to kind of get a pulse on your spending. So the way this goes is 50% of your income goes to your fixed expenses, 30% of your income goes to feet in the streets, and then 20% of your income goes to savings. That's the normal way. But if you have debt, then we got to break that down a little bit differently. So 50%... Still to fixed expenses, you got to keep it under that. 15% goes to debt, number one. 15% goes to savings. So you're saving a little bit less than the previous example. And then 20% is what you get to spend, have a good time with instead of 30%. So you got to have a tighter variable expenses and discretionary spending while you're taking care of your debt. Then once you're debt free, you can increase your 20% back up to 30%. And then you can also increase your savings from 15% to 20% and life will be awesome. You can cut the episode off now. I gave you the secret to everything. Just kidding. Okay, so now I want to talk about the various buckets that exist within budgets and how they relate to my budget. So the first thing is savings. I talk all the time about paying yourself first. So when money comes in, I set aside 20% for retirement. Now, Without a fully funded emergency fund, I would focus on that first. 
Once that's complete, then you move on to other savings goals. And I truly do do this first. I believe that the biggest mistake that people make is saving what's left over. Paying yourself first is so important. You matter enough to put you at the front of the line of people that need to be paid when money comes in. So the next bucket we should talk about is debt. So I've been very fortunate not to have had debt almost ever, almost. So I've always paid cash for my cars because I don't believe cars are assets and don't ever want a car note. I was a scholarship athlete, so I didn't have student loans. And then I paid for my graduate education out of pocket. I have had mortgages and currently own one of my homes outright, but am in the process of selling the other that does have a mortgage, but Corona is throwing all kinds of shade at the process. I'm actually hemorrhaging money as I pay like mortgage and property taxes and utilities on an empty home, which is not fun. I'd love for my discretionary spending to be going somewhere else right now. (sighs) And while I would love to wear the badge of having never carried credit card debt, And while I would love to say that I've worn the badge of never, ever having carried credit card debt, it would almost be true. I'm proud to say, though, that the time that I did was very short. And I did gain the experience of what it's like to have the second worst kind of debt there is. So credit card debt is the second worst kind of debt. Payday loans are definitely the worst kind of debt. So my heart goes out to anybody who's ever had to take a payday loan. The reason I had the credit card debt was I was building my business and expenses started to rise and there were some big ticket items that I felt I needed in order to grow the business despite not having enough coming in to cover them. So when you start a business, it's like your child and you'll do whatever you have to to make sure that child is taken care of. So spending decisions are made with emotion as opposed to rationale. So at first I was dumping money for my savings in to kind of cover the business account. But eventually, I had to hit the pause button and remind myself of the big picture. I didn't want to look up one day and have no savings and still not have enough income coming in from this business, so I decided to stop bailing the business out. The result was me carrying credit card debt for about 18 months, which forced me to get really uncomfortable. I had to cut unnecessary expenses, and I had to really kick my efforts into overdrive to start bringing in more income. It was super stressful for me personally because I am very debt averse. So much so that a big factor in my selling that house that I just mentioned is because I want to be 100% debt free. So my original goal was to own that house outright, but life happened and I couldn't have my cake and eat it too. So in this current stage of life, I would rather get rid of that house and be debt free than I would continue on with paying it down and actually finally one day owning it in full the way I do my other home. All right, so back to the credit card debt. Now that I have the experience of coming up with a debt repayment plan for myself and feeling the pain of giving away money in the form of interest, and I must say that was awful, I can see why people want to ignore it instead of deal with it, especially when there's not enough coming in to get rid of it. I'm so grateful that it's gone and hope to never be in a situation where I would take on credit card debt again. All right, so that's my spiel on debt. If you have debt, my recommendation is to prioritize it right after saving and put 15% of your income toward paying it down. That is 15% in addition to the minimum payment. So the minimum payment is kind of an obligation. After savings and debt comes obligations or what people like to call their fixed expenses. So that's the next thing in the budgeting process. And so my rule of thumb is that fixed expenses should not account for more than 50% of your income. Usually one of the biggest things in this category is housing, and it's generally suggested that you don't spend more than 30% on housing. For me, my fixed expenses are really low. The main reason being I don't have rent or mortgage to worry about. Yes, I know I just talked to you about a house that I was selling, but that's an investment property, so that runs out of a business account. I'm talking about my personal expenses right now. So as I mentioned, I'm very debt averse, so owning a home outright was really, really important to me. So I saved up, I paid cash for something, very, very humble. And I have to tell you, most of my friends can't hide their disappointment when they see what I call the Witham Chalet for the very first time. They wonder why the heck a four-time Olympian would be living here. But as a person with an entrepreneurial spirit, I don't want the stress of having to worry about coming up with the funds to keep a roof over my head. So all I have to worry about is modest property tax and homeowner's insurance. And quite frankly, I could work at pretty much any minimum wage job and cover that expense. 
So it takes just the pressure off of me to have to earn to pay bills, to earn to pay bills sort of deal. And as for the expenses I do have that are in the fixed expense category, there's gas, which comes out to around $75 per month. There's gas, which is about $75 a month. I mostly work from home and maybe go to the office twice a week when I'm in town, but I also travel a lot, Um, not usually around to drive my car. And then there's gas for my house, like gas stove and stuff. That's like 45 bucks. Water, 64. Electric, 124. Dog food, 80. As for grooming for my dog, I just wash him in the shower or the backyard. I do, however, go all out and buy him the fancy shampoo. So I don't mind spending $20 on one bottle of shampoo because I know that grooming is around $100. And you got to tip these people and do all this extra stuff. So... I am all too keen to skip over the $7 bottle, buy the $20 bottle, knowing he's getting a fancy shampoo. And he's going to get multiple shampoos out that $20 bottle as opposed to one wash from that $100 groomer. So all in all, my regular obligations make up about 25% of my expenses. And then I have my variable expenses. So that's the stuff that kind of fluctuates that are a little bit more fun. Things that you would get rid of if push came to shove and is very much discretionary. So Kind of got my basic variable expenses, which I'm calling 15%, which is stuff like entertainment, self-care, massages, subscriptions. I was looking at my budget and realized I spent $930 on my hair for the year, not for a month. Um, So that's roughly like $80 a month. And the thing I like about the way that I budget is that it kind of adds these things up. So you know what the average is, because if it's not something you do every month, how do you know how to save for it on a monthly basis? So now I know that my hair is around $80 a month, even though it's actually more than that when I go, but I only go every so often. And so I go over my budget fairly regularly, but I got to say one thing that made me want to barf when I thought about saying it out loud to you guys was yard. So I spend $300 a month on the yard and it makes me want to go get a lawnmower. This is why having a tangible budget and looking at it on a regular basis is important because things get automated and you don't feel them as much. But I looked at that and I was like, ooh, wait a minute, hold on. I'm going to be looking for a cheaper yard, man. If you cut grass in the DFW area, reach out to me. (laughs) All right, something else in the variable expenses category is food. So yes, we need to eat to live and it is kind of an obligation that we have food, but we all know that it very much fluctuates, you know, food purchases from one month to the next. That's the nature of how things are. You know, you go out, a lot one month, special occasion happens. Next month is groceries. You know, this is another plug for tracking your expenses because in order to stabilize it, you need to be able to see what do you spend on average. So as an example, my average food budget is $600. So I don't spend $600 every single month. Some months I'm out and I'm in a fancy place. Other months I'm home. Good example is COVID where everybody probably recently bought more than they usually do. But ideally, That'll spread out over time. If you don't waste a lot, it'll all even out. But you still need to know what is your food expense? What should I be doing? And if you have a $1,200 month, that's like, whoa, wait a minute. This is not the average. Like, what's going on here or something? All right. So I've mentioned a few things to you and I've showed you that my expenses are relatively low to start out. But it's like, okay, Lauren, you're not frugal, Fanny. Come on, give us the real. So where does most of my budget go? Travel. Yes. 50% of my expenses last year were travel related. I have the bug, y'all. And I'm not ashamed to say it. It is what it is. I just downloaded an app where you can track the places that you've been and learn that I've been to 49 countries. So got to go somewhere this year to get to the 50. Now now that I have a, a numerical goal to try to reach. Now, I don't have a goal of going to every single country, but I did make a list once I got my app up and running of 26 more countries I would like to visit. So I'm choosing to keep my expenses low in other areas so that I can enjoy seeing new places. And I think it's important to note that I'm not staying in hotels all the time and booking fancy tours with guides. I'm staying in Airbnbs, the occasional hostel. I'm taking public transportation, eating what the locals eat. I would describe it as traveling, which is not the same thing as vacationing, but I enjoy it nonetheless. Also, I'm a 10% giver. So that is set aside immediately and it's not optional in my book. While I am a Christian, I have to be honest and tell you guys that my 10% does not go to the church in its entirety. 
My guiding principle for giving lines up well with the verse from 2 Corinthians. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves people who give cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Now, I know a lot of people don't feel like they have 10% to give, but that's generally because they're not clear on where money is being spent. Deciding to be a giver requires knowing where that other 90% is going. You've got to get organized so that you can feel good about giving some of it away. And it also helps fight off the scarcity mindset giving does. So when you operate from a place of abundance, your mindset is like, wow, 90% is more than enough. So if you're not currently giving, I encourage you to look at how you might be able to. Okay, so what am I using as a budgeting tool? I think you guys can probably guess if you listen to previous episodes. I use YNAB, also known as You Need a Budget. And the good thing about sticking to something like this is that it has like report features, So you can actually know everything that came in and went out over the last year or however long you've been budgeting for. And I'd say that knowing what's going on and being able to get those averages is really important for entrepreneurs. So I think that everyone should track their expenses, even if just for a little while. And I also think that tracking is where budgets get a bad rap. So let's use cleaning your house as an analogy. Some people love cleaning up. It doesn't feel like work because cleaning is therapeutic and they enjoy the end result. Others love a clean house, but cleaning is a chore. It's a time suck, and there's just nothing about it that's fun, and it actually makes them sad. Well, even if those people have a housekeeper, they have to do some level of cleaning sometimes. You don't just put your dishes on the floor. The laundry doesn't do itself. If you spill something, you need to wipe it up. So how does this analogy relate to expense tracking? Well, Some love knowing that everything has a place and that it's all been accounted for and it doesn't feel like a chore to them to track their expenses. However, others just feel like they're not cut out for this long-term reoccurring chore. It makes them miserable. I would say you need to do it on some level. So clean the house you live in and your financial house. Otherwise, you're going to have roaches and debt. (laughs) All right, all right, I am doing a lot of talking. So let me summarize my budgeting practice. Money comes in, 10% is set aside to give, 25% is set aside for taxes. I know I didn't talk about that a whole lot, but Uncle Sam has to get his. So if you're an entrepreneur, set it aside. 20% is put into savings. And then the rest drops into my checking account to cover the other various expenses I have. As an entrepreneur, What is coming in fluctuates dramatically. That's why it's important to understand what the bare minimum amount is that's needed and then work on getting streams of income that will steadily provide that. Once you're above and beyond that, it gives you room to fund your other objectives. Sometimes I can't do all the travel I want to because I don't have enough coming in. But when what's coming in does not match up with all you're wanting to spend on, that creates the incentive to go out and get more income. As we wrap up, I got a few takeaway tips for you. Number one, numbers don't lie. Tracking is important, even if you don't do it forever. Number two, write it down and make it real. Your spending plan cannot just exist in your head. It has to be tangible so you can feel it. Feeling it creates awareness. Number three, remember benchmarks are suggestions based on what most people do. Ultimately, you should be building a budget that is custom to you and your goals. Align your spending with your values. Living out a suitcase because you're constantly changing location may not resonate with you. Hearing that I spent $30,000 on travel might make you feel sick. I feel similar when I hear about daycare costs or $500 car payments or large monthly housing costs. Those things don't align with my values, but who cares what I think about your choices? Maybe you hate planes and never want to go anywhere you can't drive, so that's why you have a really nice car. Maybe you're a severe introvert and spend most of your free time at home, so you pay for the comforts of a place where you will be spending most of your time. We have to ditch the judgment around others' choices, but encourage each other to regularly reflect on our spending and whether it continues to align with our values. We should also encourage each other to save because no one can work forever And not considering your future right now can be detrimental later on. 
All right, that is my spiel on budgeting from the LW point of view. We've got some upcoming episodes and they're all about budgeting. We've got a parent coming on to talk about what it's like to budget for expenses related to kids. We have a young lady coming on whose Instagram handle is I don't do budgets. Yes, guys, that's exactly the opposite of what I just said, but we got to get all the different perspectives. I'm so interested to find out if you don't do budgets, what do you do? How do you handle your finances, right? We've got a travel enthusiast. We've got a member of the FIRE movement. So tune in over the next few weeks and listen to all the various perspectives on budgeting because there's not one right way to do it. As always, if you have questions, suggestions for guests, or would like to share your own money memoir, don't hesitate to reach out to us at worth-listening.com. 